Well, Akimi, uh, thank you for giving me the mic. I promise I will give it back. Uh, but first, let me uh, start by just welcoming all of you. Um, it is an absolute joy and pleasure to see all of these faces, the smiling ones that I know and the ones that I haven't met yet. Um, and I, I want to welcome you to this, the fourth uh, and final event of ALF's Truth, Love, and Reconciliation Speaker Series. Um, you know, I want to acknowledge that this time, you know, of dialogue um, is necessary for kind of bold leadership in our communities and to have fellows uh, and partners uh, participate in these dialogues is really, really important. Um, but before I continue, I want to make sure that I, I do the land acknowledgement. And so, you know, I'd, I'd like to begin with the land acknowledgement and to recognize the interconnectedness and the responsibilities across history and, and the multicultural community today. So across Silicon Valley, um, we're on the land of the Ohlone. Uh, we know that Darren is in New York and others are joining us across the United States on tribal lands. And we thank you um, for uh, being for the past and present and future generations of those tribes. So as we gather for this purpose of leadership for the common good, let us remember that to create a truly inclusive community and democracy, we must work to unpack our history of colonialism and dismantle those current systems of injustice so that people in all of our communities can thrive and succeed. Um, and so with that, I'd really like to thank our sponsors for the event today. Um, you know, we have the Soprato Foundation, the Applied Materials, City of San Jose, Google, Heritage Bank, Kaiser Permanente. At some point, I'd like to get the ribbon end uh, for Netflix up there. Uh, but it really, really is uh, only through the support of companies and individuals at those companies that we can do these kinds of great uh, events. And with that, um, I'd like to introduce uh, Carol Larson um, from Class 15. She's the former CEO of the David and Lucille Packard Foundation. Carol? You might be on mute. Okay, great to see all of you. I should learn that, unmute yourself. Anyway, uh, nice to be here at the fourth and uh, final dialogue for this year of Truth, Reconciliation and Love series. Uh, these truly are tumultuous times when we're called upon to confront and discuss some of the most destructive and perplexing systemic problems. And today's dialogue will focus on roots of racial inequity and how reparations might and can have an impact. So with all ALF events, the hope for it is that those in attendance who represent leaders from across a number of sectors will be inspired to learn more, to take steps toward greater truth, telling and hearing and greater reconciliation, not only here in Silicon Valley, but across the country. So you can see if someone puts up the agenda slide, I won't take much time, but it's gonna begin with remarks from our very special guest, Darren Walker and conversation with Suzanne, Q and A, dialogue breakouts, and then reflections and reporting back. Um, but let me get right to saying a few words about Darren. Uh, Darren, I promise not to do it too long, but uh, everyone's probably read a formal bio of Darren. And what I wanted to do instead was to pull out things I know about Darren that are aligned so well with what ALF tries to inspire in leaders. So first, you know, Darren calls on us to use our privilege. He remembers his roots as a toddler in Texas who entered the nation's first Head Start class. He remembers his family and mentors and circumstances that gave him his opportunity in life and that compels him with a sense of paying back and putting his privilege to work. Second, he's not just about philanthropy. Like everyone on this call, he knows the value and necessity of working across sectors of civil society, government, private corporations. He has made personal contributions in each one of those areas and continues to do so. He ran a really large community development association and served on countless and continues to on countless nonprofit boards. He's led huge initiatives at Rockefeller before Ford, then at Ford and now at Ford as president since 2013. Uh, he cajoles, 
He partners with and he contributes to the corporate community, serving including on boards such as PepsiCo, Square, Ralph Lauren. He's really known nationally for multi-sector initiatives. You know, whether it was helping to save Detroit from bankruptcy and working across sectors to do that, or pioneering new laws and regulations to encourage impact investing strategies. And local, state, and national governments tap on him often to lend his voice and leadership to cross-sector initiatives. But I have to say too, Darren, one of the things that's really special about him is he makes us think in new ways. His book, The New Gospel of Wealth, the article before and the book subsequent and all of his actions and words in between have really been causing incredible conversations in philanthropy. He won't let you think in old ways or get stuck in our views that need to be interrogated as of today. But I, while he does all of that, he also brings people together. I've sat at numerous tables with him when I was president of Packard, where we were talking about things that were difficult and required a lot of conversation, whether that was about protecting indigenous rights and traditions to protect the world's forests, or it was talking about promoting gender and reproductive rights, equity in the US and globally, about confronting moral issues, about endowment investment, and the opportunities for impact investing. We were often sitting at tables where people did not agree. They didn't share the same point of view. They operated within different organizations, different structures and different systems and progress was complex and in need of much discussion. But Darren, in my personal experience at those very important tables was an inspiring and compassionate convener and leader in those conversations. So today we're lucky, fortunate to have a similar opportunity as we have this initial dialogue at ALF around reparations. Finally, I just have to say throughout all of these experiences, Darren's decency as a human being comes true. His kindness and respect for colleagues and partners is always there. And his love of life from art to history to bulldogs and uh, to enjoying people and in all of the beauty thank of our country. So thank you, Darren, for being here and for continuing to inspire such important conversations in our country and world. Thanks, Darren. Thank you, my dear friend, Carol Larson. I miss you. I am Darren Walker. I'm a brown skin, African-American man with a bald head, lucite frame glasses. I am wearing navy, vest and blazer and I have a blue shirt on and I'm sitting in my library with library books behind me. My pronouns are he, him, his. And I'm speaking to you from the island of Manhattan, which is also the unceded territory of the Lenape people. And I'm really honored to be here. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Suzanne and John, my sister, Nicole Taylor, friends who are in uh, the sphere of influence and impact in Silicon Valley and far beyond. I was so honored when Carol uh, facilitated this invitation upon learning more about the work of the organization and the fellows program and this very challenging conversation we are having around the issue of reparations. I have worked in other settings where reparations uh, where an understanding of history uh, is centered uh, and essential in moving to real reconciliation. And as we know, you must have truth and understanding before you can have reconciliation and reparations. In the context of the United States, this is a fraught enterprise. It is a fraught enterprise because our country, the country I love, the country that made possible my story, certainly a story that could not have been possible in any other country, is a country that I love deeply. My love is unwavering, but I also have rage. I have anger. I have a sense 
of a lack of fulfillment of those ideals upon which this country was founded. And so how do we reconcile the contradictions of this country, the contradictions in the founding documents and the reality of the lived experience? I am hopeful and I'm hopeful that we can move forward because I have no choice. I stand on the shoulders of men and women who for centuries believed in this country, even when this country did not believe in them. I stand on the shoulders of Fannie Lou Hamer, who was beaten, who was treated in the most inhumane ways. I stand on the shoulders of W.E.B. Du Bois, the shoulders of Langston Hughes, a black queer man who lived in Harlem in the 1930s and wrote my favorite poem about his experience. The poem is called, Let America Be America Again. And it starts in the first stanza, Let America Be America Again. America never was America to me. And yet he ends in the final stanza by saying, but oh yes, someday America will be. So I stand on the shoulders of this man who knew just as W.E.B. Du Bois, Frederick Douglass, Fannie Lou Hamer, Ida B. Wells, and so many others knew that in their lifetime, they would never see justice in America. And yet they believed. So what choice do I have but to believe and to fulfill the work that they started and to take the privilege that they helped create and to use that privilege, to use that privilege to demand responsibility accountability and engagement, and to do that from a position of grace, of love, of generosity, and to engage especially with our white brothers and sisters, allies who want to be on the journey and who we need to be on the journey with us to create the safe space so that they can be on the journey without fear that because of their own ignorance, their own lack of familiarity or context to the lived reality of black folks and brown folks and queer folks and others that they might make a mistake on that journey with us. We have to give them the safe space so that they can make those mistakes and that they can learn from those mistakes. And we have to continue to demand, to demand justice and to demand that this country actually fulfill the words, the words that Thomas Jefferson wrote to his friend Samuel DuPont when he said, the work of America is to build a just nation. Now, obviously there is some irony in Thomas Jefferson uttering those words. And yet I want to hold Jefferson to his word. I want to hold America to its word. And I think the work that you all are doing is part of that effort to hold this country, to hold the mirror up to this country and to ask, who are we? And what is it we need to do to make this country whole, to heal this country, to overcome the pain, the trauma, the anguish that has been, been visited upon too many of us. And so I'm so grateful for the chance to talk with you and be a part of this conversation. And Suzanne, I'm looking forward to speaking with you. Darren, thank you so, so much. That was just a beautiful way to start this conversation and set the tone. And I am just so grateful that the planets aligned 
uh, to bring you here with us today. Uh, I know that we're, you, we're, we're being squeezed in between a couple of <laughs> book signings and and other things that you have going and so um just another night in new york city that's another night in new york. Yeah. <laughs> well good that's good. That good believe me <laughs> that is a great thing so i want to you know i i want to start out with just sharing a tradition at alf or a practice that we have which is to check in and what we do as fellows what we do in our in our um, senior fellow circles is to first meet each other as people Right? And to check in with what's on our heart, our mind. Um, how are you showing up today? So Darren Walker, how are you? Well, thank you. Uh, I am all things considered. And I think this is an important preamble because we're often asked, how are you? And I, I have to always begin with all things considered. And then it makes it possible to say, I'm doing great. Uh, and it allows me to put uh, my issues into context. Um, and, and so, yes, as my mother, uh, who grew up very poor in, in rural Louisiana says, you know, when I talk about my issues, <laughs> she will say, boy, you have high class problems. And, and so, yes, um, all things considered, I am doing just great. Uh, that doesn't mean that on any given day, um, I don't, um, grieve uh, the loss of my beloved husband who died suddenly two years ago. And, um, and I thought uh, that it would be easier, but it's not easier, actually, 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 it's not easy. And it doesn't get easier, which is what my wonderful grief counselor told me it would. Um, we'll see if it gets easier as time passes, as I'm told. But absolutely, every day when any of us has this kind of grief, um, we struggle on a daily basis to find the places for joy and laughter uh, and happiness uh, when there is that cloud um, always in the room with you. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. We are all grieving a lot. And I think we haven't even scratched the surface um, as a society, as a community. So I appreciate you checking in on that, Darren. Um, yesterday I read, your bold announcement coming out of the Ford Foundation uh, that the Ford will no longer take on fossil fuel related investments. Thank you and congratulations. And that's a big deal coming from the it, Ford. It is, you know, but Suzanne, let's, I mean, you know, we don't know each other, but I mean, we, let's just really talk about it. Talk about it. It's yeah. bold, it's long overdue. Shame on us that it took us this long. Mm -hmm. um, it, mm -hmm. it, I would have wished we could have done it sooner. The as my dear uh, friend Carol Larson and probably Nicole and others know, when you are managing uh, an endowment that uh, has fiduciary responsibility uh, to 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 maximize um, returns, you're always in this tension between the investment part of the organization, the legal part of the organization, and the grant making part of the organization. And that tension, as CEO, you've got to manage and a board who's not always, and, and, and probably many of us, uh, if we deal at a senior level at, with our board, these tensions play out. I would have wished uh, I could have made that announcement earlier, um, but I'm glad that we did. And I'm grateful that other foundations um, were able to move before Ford was. Yeah, no, but you got there, so. We did. Progress, but I don't. But, I, but we we're in a we're in a business, Suzanne, where we're we're very self congratulatory and we're very right. um, self satisfied. Um, uh -huh. And I think uh -huh. sometimes we need to really uh, hold the mirror up to ourselves um, uh -huh. and yeah, check that and say it. Thank you. Well, I want to really dive into the focus of our of our conversation today, and I just want to start by saying that that. I and this might be the bubble I'm in, right? Because we only have what's, what's around us and the conversations we're having, but it feels like I'm hearing the word reparations. I'm hearing about, um, you know, conversations about healing our democracy and the concept of we have to make this right 
in the mainstream media more. And I, I'm just going to call out the fact that, you know, news news articles coming coming through my desk about California is the first state in the country to, you know, establish a reparation task force. We saw that Newsom just signed that bill to return Bruce's Beach to a African-American family, you know, and the fellows program, we've read the color of law and the sum of us. And there is this, it feels like a big awakening happening. And again, might be my bubble, but it does feel a little bit bigger. Is that, what is your perception of the moment that we're in and the opportunity that we have to really push through to healing and to reparations? And how would you even define reparations, Darren? Well, first, I think uh, there is no doubt that you're right. There, uh, if you just do a, go- a Google search, as, as I was doing in preparing for this, um, you, you're absolutely right. Uh, the evidence is there. It's, it's, it's mentioned more. Uh, There have been more stories about it. There are various uh, task forces and uh, sort of many commissions uh, bubbling up. We we get more inquiry at Ford uh, from various efforts. So you're absolutely right. Uh, There's no doubt. Uh, I think the uh, challenge in this country, uh, unlike the other settings where I know reparations uh, I'm familiar with, uh, uh, obviously Germany, South Africa, Rwanda, Uh, In those settings, the perpetrators of the harm and trauma fully took responsibility and collectively as a country, the perpetrators took responsibility and named the evil and uh, put value on that evil and worked through various formula, ways in which uh, there were uh, compensation in different forms to, uh, right. the, perp- to, to the victims or the, 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 the heirs of the victim. In the United States, we have a fundamental challenge. If we're to be really honest, I grew up in the South. And so I do have a perspective that may be uh, biased in some ways. Most of the white people who I grew up with, while slavery was viewed as a terrible thing, no one I ever encountered viewed it as anywhere close to the other kinds of harms uh, like, let's just use the extreme example of the Holocaust. Yeah. Uh, pe- people, uh, many white Americans feel that yes, it was horrible, it was terrible. And I've heard all sorts of things and you've seen evidence of this in, in, in polling and things. Well, it would have been worse if, had they stayed in Africa. Um, um, by coming to America, there was opportunity ultimately, another line. Um, it really, and, and the whole narrative of the lost cause served to erase the trauma and pain. And so we have a fundamental challenge. You know, when we worked with South Africa at the, at the Ford Foundation, when we worked in setting up and supporting the South Africa Commission, um, there was no uh, him and hawing and people, you know, sort of, well, I'm not sure. Well, I'm not really, there was, there was complete uh, clarity yes. on the part of the perpetrators. And we don't have that in the United States. We don't even agree on our history at this point. So it feels like well, we're far away from and that. So, right? And so reparations, yeah. I mean, you, you have to have some sense of a shared diagnosis mm-hmm. of the problem that you are seeking to repair. And so that's one thing, but it is important because I think this question of reparations um, to a lot of people means, oh my gosh, are we just going to forever be like writing a check to black people? Right, right. That reparations right. comes in many different forms. I mean, for example, I spoke recently at a, at a conference and said one form of reparation would be to, to forgive the debt of, of African-American students. Mm-hmm. The, many of these students uh, are come from families without assets. We know that 
the black white wealth gap exists because blacks have never possessed intergenerational wealth. We know that uh, more than half of the wealth transferred between the 1950s and the 1990s were homes that were purchased with the GI Bill. So grandfather purchased the house with his GI Bill in the 1940s and 50s. That house became a mechanism for financing small businesses, sure. financing college. I mean, all of the things that Black folks, because we didn't have access to the GI Bill, and even if we did, the neighborhoods that we were allowed to buy homes in were redlined. And so assets weren't mm-hmm. allowed to be created. And so the grandchildren, of those black soldiers, the great grandchildren of those black soldiers don't have money, friends and family as Mark Zuckerberg or Bill Gates or so many others had, they don't have the resources to put in uh, a a tax-free college fund because they they didn't inherit that money, right? And so we we know the core issues. Um, and, And so there have to be mechanism mechanisms to address that, to simply say, we're gonna make more capital available. Right, right. Small, but black small businesses don't need more debt. They need equity. Right. And so right. announcing that you're doing a big loan program at 2% to small businesses, I'm not really sure if you're getting at the root cause of the issue or that you're gonna address the issue that you've diagnosed, which is the low level of black um, uh, entrepreneurship. Yeah, yeah. Lots there, lots you just shared to unpack. And I, I think one of the things I come back to in my own personal experience is that there are folks that had no clue, and I'm just, I'm not gonna name names here, but there are folks that have no clue that the GI Bill didn't offer the same benefits to, to African-American people. There are leaders in our community that had no clue until they read the color of law that the biggest sort of generational wealth gain that, that white Americans had access to because we had the entitlements was through FHA loans. Mm -hmm. So we don't have that shared understanding as a community. So there still exists this myth, right? That uh, everybody has same access and same opportunity in this country. You know, I've heard people say out loud in 2021, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And here we're having this huge debate about critical race theory and about ethnic studies. How do we get to a place where we can even as you, you, you shared in, um, in other, other countries, and Canada too had this process, where we can share the history and understand it, and white Americans can champion uh, a reparations process and be at the table. Well, I think one of the things that we really do have to do is seek out white allies. Yeah. And uh, we are not going to solve these issues by speaking only to uh, black and brown folk. Uh, we Uh, have to have uh, uh, white allies. And so we need to recruit uh, more white people, more white Americans to this effort. Um, Not only because we, but because it will be better if it is more multiracial. That is the challenge of this country is to demonstrate the potential for something that's never existed before, a successful multiracial democracy. Can we demonstrate that? And so one of the things I worry about, Suzanne, quite honestly, is I think a lot of white people, a lot of white Americans are retreating from engaging, if we're to be honest. And I think, and I'm not talking about the the extremes who are, you know, oh, I don't want to deal with cancel culture and all of the, I'm talking about everyday folk who worry that by engaging, by coming into the square, they are going to be vulnerable. And they're gonna be vulnerable because they don't know the vocabulary. They aren't familiar with the context. Uh, They uh, are ignorant and lack basic uh, knowledge in some areas and therefore are likely to make a misstep to say the wrong thing that could be misconstrued or mischaracterized, uh, to, uh, in their own uh, naivete, uh, misstep, and and in the process, 
do harm to others and to themselves, mm -hmm. to their careers. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so people will say, why do I want to engage in that? Uh, and I've seen that behavior. Uh, and, and I think that is what that is also what I worry about. Now, I don't want to blame uh, folks of color for that. But I do think we if we're trying to really excavate here to get at what it's going to take, it's going to take white Americans putting that on the table, which is one of the elephants in the room. Yeah. yeah, no, completely. I couldn't agree with you more. And I mean, that's why ALF and other groups, I know folks on this call have anti-racism learning circles. I mean, that is a place where actually white leaders in ALF connect and are able to do their homework, right? And, and take risks and because we have to be a part of the solution. I appreciate you sharing that. I wanna read a quote from one of your op-eds that I just love that just kind of stood out and screamed at me here. If we, the beneficiaries of a system that perpetuate inequality are trying to reform the system that favors us, we will have to give something up. Is that true? Or can we grow the pie, Darren? Well, the pie absolutely can grow, but even as the pie grows, those of us who have been the uber beneficiaries mm -hmm. of the inequalities in the system have to actually uh, examine that system. And that's one of the really hard things I find, Suzanne, living here in New York, where uh, there is so much wealth so much inequality, and certainly you have it there in Silicon Valley, um, and, and how hard it is, because the very people you need to have this conversation with yeah. have a very hard time when you engage them in the, uh, the sort of inherent unfairness and injustice that is in the system. So what they, and it's hard, and I understand why it's hard. I mean, part, part of part of I'm sure what you all do at AL, ALF too is like the just understanding the empathy part. Like, where does that? I, I, as a queer black man who lives in New York, I actually want to understand what it feels like to be a straight white working class guy living in Topeka, yeah. uh, and 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 so I think for a lot of folks. And so I think about all right. So the the the, the wealthy private equity guy I know I'm sitting at, I'm at a talk recently right. at a private club or about, and and like he it was painful to him to engage in a system when i'm saying to him to his face yeah. the system yeah. that has benefited you and me is unfair yeah. he in engaging in that he is he is admitting that he has benefited from an unfair system. And he doesn't want to believe that. He wants, he desperately needs to believe because he's a billionaire yeah. and he has worked really hard in his mind. Sure. And so, there, and, and, and there's always this part. I started with nothing. My, you know, and I heard that, right? I started with nothing. My, my parents didn't have a college degree. I was just, you know, yeah. Uh, a white ethnic guy out on Long Island worked myself. I worked hard, and now I'm on Park Avenue and I'm a billionaire. And there's that tells you the system is right. That tells you the system is fair. And then when my retort is actually, the system is not fair, because you started as a white man with yeah. the Harvard Business School degree in 1978. Yeah. You the wind was behind you. Right. He does not want to engage in that conversation because that it, it, he, yeah. he, he can't absolve himself. Yeah. Yeah. And you're in those rooms, Darren, right? You're in those rooms. So I'm sure. curious how you are, how you are, what do you say to folks that are, are stuck and why would I, why would I come to the table to change a system that's working for me? Right. What is your, well, I don't, I don't start by, by telling them, you know, that they're all greedy and, and terrible people. And um, I, I like to talk about systems and structures because I actually don't think most people, I don't think police officers get up every day and say, I wanna be a racist police officer today. Uh, I wanna be a racist whatever. I think people work in systems that are designed 
and in the case, if we, if we talk about our criminal justice system, designed with racist intent. And, and so you work in a system, and, and again, you understand systems and, and system design. And, and I, I was just on the phone today with, with the, another foundation president talking about someone who's gone into the administration and this thing that we're working on is taking so long. And the person says to me, oh my gosh, can you believe Joe, this yeah. is, this is Joe was always and and why is he taking and I'm thinking Joe hasn't changed Joe is the same Joe we knew before he went to Washington he's gone into a system and in that system Joe is a different person and a, I mean he 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 has to be in a system that's designed and so you're in a system that was designed to get us these outcomes and so how do you and so this is what I say to to my friends who you know, you're not a bad person, but you're in this system. And you're also though, you're also uh, susceptible and desire to be affirmed, right? You desire to be uh, validated. And so that's also the problem because the other reality is the, the wealthier you become, the more likely you are to be validated in your thinking. You are not going to have people say, uh, actually, uh, I don't agree with you. Like, you know, a lot of folks on this call know exactly what I'm talking about, I bet. You know, the, the wealthier you get, the hot, you, you, would, you might think that people, because they might run a public company or might serve on the board of this nonprofit or that are, uh, are likely to hear. Um, no, they're not actually. They're, they're much less likely to hear people challenge them and tell them that they are fundamentally misinformed about issues that they are asserting domain over. What's the most creative and successful version of reparations that you have seen? You said it's not always about writing a check, right? There's so much more to that. But have you seen, you know, microcosms or examples, pilots in the United States that have been successful and you're inspired by? I haven't seen um, successful long-term gain ever. I think there are efforts over the years that have been uh, successful. Uh, when I think about the progress we made uh, between uh, the, the mid-1960s and 1980, yeah. uh, there was tremendous progress. We saw, for the first time, the, the, the wage gap uh, between Black and white workers begin to uh, uh, close. We saw the asset gap begin to close. We saw the highest levels of Black male education achievement and higher education. Uh, I mean, there were a number of trends that were absolutely demonstrating that the potential to bring uh, closer uh, uh, indicators of, of well-being uh, were being realized. And that came to an end. Um, and the combination, I mean, there's a lot of social science uh, research on this question, but uh, there's no doubt that the convergence of a particular kind of Friedman economics, the convergence of, um, of, of this kind of, uh, uh, we've got to get rid of the welfare queen and all these narratives right. um, that, that, that villainized um, uh, urban and particularly African-Americans. Um, and of course, uh, the, the war on drugs and again, designed to, to, to get us uh, a discriminatory impact and, and all of the, 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 the efforts around crime uh, prevention that were targeted uh, on African-American neighborhoods, all of these things uh, contributed to a reversal of, of real progress that we saw. But in terms of, uh, Suzanne, you know, specific programs, I mean, like in, like in uh, South Africa, where they've got the Black Economic um, um, Initiative, or in, in, in Germany, where uh, 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 people who uh, were in any way a, a, attached uh, or, or to any of the concentration camps or any of the efforts to, to uh, retain uh, Germans or Roma are the many people who today are still getting checks, right? Um, um, we have never done anything like that in this country. Maybe it's I mean, look at what's happening with, with the, the black farmers right now. There was an effort around okay. reparation. And what, what was the response? The response was outrage yeah. Yeah. from 
white farmers who said, uh, we've um, been disadvantaged too. And it is in fact discriminatory to yeah. favor black farmers and attempting to address the historic wrongs that were done to black farmers. It is illegal to do that. And yeah. given the state of our courts, um, <laughs> it is quite likely that uh, that, that uh, line of thinking, uh, if they were plaintiffs, uh, that they would prevail in a court of law. What I'm learning today from you too, Darren, is just doubling down on the truth telling and the, the truth piece of this, right? The storytelling piece of this. I remember when Reed Hastings and John Hicks hosted us over at Netflix for a network engagement uh, opportunity to watch 13th together. And, you know, with people who are white corporate leaders, with, you know, folks in the community that are change makers, but don't know, aren't, don't have this, and these stories and don't seek them out, right? And that was a game changing night for a lot of people. How can the arts play a role and any deep reparations movement and in strengthening our democracy. Could you imagine advising and partnering with like a community foundation here? I know you've done this before. To well, it's so interesting that arts. you say that and you mentioned yeah. 13 because, because yeah. I had a similar situation, uh, a friend who is an arts patron in New York, a woman called Agnes Gund, who like many of those corporate executives, she went to, uh, to see 13, the opening night of the New York Film Festival at Lincoln Center. She had no idea yeah, yeah. No idea that there was literally a clause in the 13th Amendment that said you, we can, it is not constitutional or legal to enslave another American, yeah. except right. if they've been convicted yeah. of a crime. Yeah. And if they have been convicted of a crime, you can indeed enslave them. Yeah. And and she had no idea. And, and and so what she did actually was to sell a painting, sell her prized Liechtenstein for one hundred and sixty five million dollars. And she took a uh, hundred million dollars of that proceeds. And yeah. with Ford, we committed a like amount has been on a campaign uh, around uh, addressing issues of injustice in our criminal justice system. And so and, and part of the way she has done that as an arts patron, Agnes Gunn is President Emerita of the, of the Museum of Modern Art, the way uh, Aggie has, has done that is to invest in artists addressing yeah. issues of justice. And so that can be uh, the painter, the visual artist, uh, Titus Kapur, who does a lot of work uh, at this intersection of art and justice, or uh, Reginald uh, Betts, Dwayne Betts, who uh, is himself a poet, uh, Yale Law, who at 16 was incarcerated for a hijacking, for a carjacking, and, and is now, you know, one of America's great poets, and he's doing a program on libraries in prisons. The point is, artists have a role to play. And I believe, as you say, a, a, a community foundation is well positioned because there are donors who themselves are interested in the arts and also interested in justice, but don't necessarily see how they converge in a programmatic uh, manifest. And you actually can do that. And I, I just would say the program is called Art for Justice. And um, it has spurred, uh, you know, we've raised another $25 million uh, in the last uh, year. Um, and it's just been remarkable. The number of artists who got engaged in this. We had Julie Moretto, the great uh, uh, painter, Who's, who mm -hmm. gave up painting and it sold for $8 million. Um, <laughs> and so we were able to use that to fund artists to elevate and lift up these issues of injustice. Well, I know the arts community here, our arts and culture uh, uh, affinity group at ALF and certainly Nicole's team would, would love to, to have some, some advice and partnership there. And I wanna just say that, you know, a, uh, the Silicon Valley Community Foundation, thank you, Nicole, I know you're on the call, is really leading the way too. And how do we, what does reparations mean and how can we be part of the change we seek, right? Because we can co-create solutions personally and our own organizations and in our broader community. This isn't, you know, someone or something where waiting for. We are the system, right? So on that note, what are the tangible steps that we can take uh, today, the leaders on this call, the people that are in those systems to keep our eyes open and to seed uh, a, 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 a revolution that prioritizes people over, over profits? Well, I think uh, to the extent that ALF can 
do the work that you do, which is to uh, plant those seeds of conversation, to uh, structure and facilitate the dialogue that is necessary for the kind of equanimity that we need and are so sorely, uh, profoundly lacking uh, in uh, our uh, leadership uh, class, uh, the, the necessity of uh, building bridges uh, at a time when there are no incentives, it seems, to build bridges. In fact, the incentives are to burn bridges. Um, how, do we, how do we talk about that? I think, I think just being able to talk about that and validate that what you're feeling and you may not be comfortable saying, I'm gonna say it and create the space so that we can engage. Mm, I love that. And for the public sector and nonprofit leaders and private sector folks on the call, I mean, what I'm taking from this is there are, we all have a role to play in this, right? Um, Darren, you said hope is the oxygen of democracy. What gives you hope? Oh, you know, I uh, get uh, hopeful every time I walk out on the streets of New York. <laughs> you know, I, I, if I ever am, I mean, well, look, I live in New York. There, there's no reason to ever be bored. Uh, there is no reason to ever uh, say I'm, you know, I don't have enough stimulation to think about the world. Um, right. But I do get hope because I, when you are in the business of philanthropy, if you're Nicole or Carol or me, I mean, we're in the business of hope. Every day we get to see the stories of resilience. Uh, we get to visit places uh, where you might think visiting uh, a favela in Rio or a slum or a rural village in India is a place that might be depressing, but you actually are inspired by the courage of people. That's why I always, as I said, where we started, Suzanne, on all things considered, uh, yeah. all things considered, um, when you see uh, the courage of these folks, uh, shame on me if I'm not hopeful, if I still am not fighting to believe and be optimistic. Uh, what a tragedy uh, and a waste I am with all of my privilege uh, and all of the blessings that I've been bestowed with. If I am not hopeful, that's my obligation. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm naive. Right. I, you have to fight to be hopeful some days and you have to fight with people who are trying to take the hope away from others and who are working to strip others of their dignity. So that's what we have to fight for because in doing that fight, we are hopefully bringing hope to others, helping others live their lives with dignity. And that ought to give us all hope. Amen to that. A couple more quick questions. If you have the time, Darren, from our audience here, I'm just reading, you know, can we act first in terms of reparations and believe later and do, do or do truth telling and storytelling along parallel while we offer uh, and fight for reparations for communities that didn't have access? I mean, is that, is that possible? Well, I think there are some communities, and again, it depends on what level you're speaking. I think there are some local communities that are ready, that are yeah. ripe and prepared for this conversation. And in fact, there have been some municipalities who have taken action. Again, it's, it's very nascent. So this is why I couldn't say earlier, have I seen anything that's worked over? I, there, there isn't, but there, there are local communities. And so that's where we have to begin this conversation. Mm -hmm. I just think some of the grandiose, let's have a national commission. Um, and I mean, trying to do that uh, in parallel with the conversation will be much harder. I actually think having these efforts bubble up organically in places demonstrating the efficacy of the idea that this isn't some far-fetched idea uh, right. that, is, that is utopia, Pollyannish. Um, I think it's so important. Yeah, 
No, it's beautiful. You talked about local just in terms of uh, starting there. I mean, advice for the partners that need to be at the table. I feel like ALF is a great place to be having this conversation. I was going to say, uh, yeah. Suzanne, ALF is where you need to be. <laughs> oh, maybe you need to start a, sure. maybe you need to start a program on facilitating <laughs> helping reparations uh, process. Funny, funny you should mention that, Darren. <laughs> we have been having conversations about truth, love, and reconciliation, and truth telling and storytelling. Um, definitely, uh, given you know, we we also have people in this network. In fact, we invite people that have opposing views. Right? We want those. You should. We want that tension, right? And we want those those perspectives at the table. Um, you know, and. I'm sure as a, you know, African-American man who uh, is in the position you're in and exists on this, in this country and on this planet, you have experienced racism in your lifetime. And it feels like it has gotten more overt uh, in the last several years. How do we, how do we start to reverse that trend? How, what do you do when you see that in the position that you're in and experience that? Well, yeah. just to be clear, you know, I don't experience the kind of racism that the average black man or the average black gay man uh, experiences. I live, I live in a very privileged. So I'm not, a, I'm not a prototype, but I, I absolutely understand. Uh, and I wasn't president of the Ford Foundation. I didn't have all this, you know. I yeah, right. so, so I understand though what it feels like to when you're walking into a Fifth Avenue building to have the doorman presume that you. Uh, are a driver and should be using the side entrance. All of those things uh, we all can relate to, but those are small indignities. The kinds of, of rank, racist, uh, structural things that most black people uh, experience. Uh, those of us who live um, in, in, uh, are, yeah. but, but, but to my mind, that's why we should be doubling down. Yeah. Um, and 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 we're not naive because we know that our sons and daughters uh, are out and and they could be driving and the very issues that happened uh, to to any uh, one of of uh, the black folks who have been killed um, behind the wheel or jogging or whatever could happen to them. Um, so we're also not naive. But I just think that I just think that we have to speak that truth. Uh, and to and to name that and to be comfortable naming that in many different spheres of influence where we sit in the places and spaces where we sit. Absolutely. I love Derek's question. And I think I'll probably end on this here. Great questions from the audience. Thank you so much, friends. Dream out loud and tell us which three areas you think should be addressed first and why. And for my friend Jennifer Loving, who might be on the call, housing better be one of them, Darren. <laughs> Well, but Jennifer is always housing, and to, to Jennifer's uh, great credit, of course, what she has done uh, out in Silicon Valley and San Jose and that region is nothing short of transformational in terms of her leadership. Um, and I'm biased because she and I both share Chuck Robbins uh, yeah. on our boards and are very lucky to have, there's enough of Chuck to go around for her and me. Um, but what I will say, what I will say um, is we have to focus on education. Um, I absolutely believe that we, if we do not have an educated citizenry, uh, our democracy uh, has no future. Um, secondly, we have to focus on our system of justice. If uh, we do not have a rule of law that is applied evenly to all of us, uh, there will not be trust. And trust is essential in a democracy. And there is no doubt that the issues of housing, of work, of transportation, uh, these issues are all interrelated and they cannot be dealt with uh, in silos because that's not how people live their lives. People don't live their lives in program silos that uh, align with uh, foundation uh, budgets and programs or, or, or government uh, budgets and programs. Um, they live intersectional lives, and we need to design our systems of funding, uh, recognizing that. Amen to that. I love it. Darren, this is just, I could talk to you for, you know, could we go oh, another sorry. half hour? Because we haven't even gotten into democracy yet. Very kind to let me come and interrupt your, your, your uh, the, the, the LF uh, meeting. I really appreciate it. 
No, so grateful. So grateful. And I'm going to be handing it over to Akemi, but I want you to consider ALF a friend as well. And, uh, and Absolutely. many leaders on the call here in Silicon Valley who admire your work and are watching. Well, from far, I so. really admire all that you do at ALF. So thank you for this. And thanks, Carol and Nicole and John. Really, really a huge. Thank you. Thank thank you. Nicole, somewhere. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for being here.